shoots itself minus there's some Labeef shots that are like very obviously green screen, poorly weird shots that feel like they forgot to to film Shia and were like, oh, we got to go do pickups. Uh, hey, does anyone have a green sheet we can throw in the background and film? <laughs> Besides those like few shots, that's that scene is so well choreographed, and it's just got that Spielberg camera motion that just it's so lively. And the fighting in the car, it's great. Yeah. And I will I'll defend a lot of scenes from that movie. Honestly, there's a lot of parts. Like I think that the the sequence with the ants is pretty fun. Like the dude getting pulled down into the ant hole by all of the ants. It's a it's a great little moment. Or the uh, what's her name squishing the ant in between her legs as they like crawl up yeah. to try to get her like there's little beats in there that are actually really good I will even go as far as to say there are some visual effects and moments in the alien sequence that I enjoy and I just rewatched the movie a couple days ago and there are parts of that where I'm like man if they hadn't told me that this was going to be an alien from like minute one like, the second that movie starts out, like, I mean, not the second, but it's, like, ten minutes into the movie when they're like, look at this hieroglyphic. It looks just like an alien. You're like, okay, so this one's about aliens? This movie, 2007, I feel like was just a hair away from when CGI became really amazing. Right. And there's some stuff in this movie where it looks like a, a, a video game. Yep. And that takes me totally out of it because all the other Indiana Jones movies are all practical, beautiful, well done, amazing sets and locations. And then you get this video game jungle. Okay, so this is kind of transitioning over to the Frank Darabont script. As I was reading that, I was like envisioning sequences from a from like a director's perspective and going like, oh, this, this sequence totally works. I know how I, I would shoot this. And those are a lot of times the sequences that made it into the final movie. And when I see them, I'm like, oh, that didn't work at all when we saw it. Like the refrigerator shooting through the air. Like you could have you could have made it launch a little ways and given it a little distance and made it feel like this was a plausible thing. But when the refrigerator launches like six and a half miles... <laughs> past a car going 60 miles an hour or 40 miles an hour and dude just gets up and walks away and looks back it's like it's unbel- it's too unbelievable even for an indiana jones movie and it's even made worse by the fact that it's just cgi had they actually launched a refrigerator at 60 miles an hour through the air <laughs> I would have at least been like, hey, man, at least they launched the refrigerator 60 miles an hour through the air. That idea, I believe, I read somewhere that it was supposed to be in a Back to the Future movie where Marty McFly is in a, a nuclear test zone and he gets into that fridge and gets launched. So, Oh, that feels like such a Back to the Future moment. It just feels like, uh, like a, a, a lost script, a lost Back to the Future script idea, 100%. I dig it because the iconic um, moment where he gets up and he has his hat on and he's silhouetted against the huge explosion. It's beautiful. It's a great idea. But but they they could have done that in a in a, a little simpler way, like show us something practical, put it together a little bit cleaner. And I think it would have sold better. I think that shot's great. And I love when he comes into that into that little uh nuke town that's going to be blown so up cool. and it's it's such a fun moment and reading it in the darabont script because that sequence is taken right from the darabont script like it's well, let's, exactly let's get into it let's get into it so the the darabont script opens up and instead of like indy being captured by the russians he's actually just kind of hanging out in the desert and finding these little native american artifacts and pottery and he meets up with a friend of his yuri i believe his name is And uh, they kind of just like have a burger at that Atomic Cafe, which I think is a really nice little touch. Yeah, it is. That I think that intro really feels more Indiana Jonesy to me. Just opening up on Indy already captured, which is how Kingdom of the Crystal Skull starts, just doesn't feel Indiana Jones to me. Indiana Jones, like like Raiders, it opens on a positive where he's going to find something, and there's like this excitement of what's going to happen. There's like a build. This one is just like, 
well, we're already in the shit, and we missed half of something that happened, and I guess he's already adventuring or something. That I, I like that sitting and having a burger and getting essentially betrayed in the beginning by someone that we already know. Like, we've come to know Yuri. He's all into America. He's all about it, and it's this really fun moment of them just sitting and having a burger. Yeah, he, like, praises burgers and ketchup, and, you know, he's going, I love America, that kind of thing. Then... Yuri goes away and Jones goes into the desert and he's kind of like, oh, this is a part that could have been really terrible where he's playing the, the Indian flute, the Native American flute, uh, take the A train. Oh, yeah, yeah. Do they And they call that back later, too, I think, in the script. Yeah, don't they? yeah, yeah. There's a call back to that. Um, but that like that could have been hand, mishandled. But then what happens? He's just like on a hill and sees Yuri meet up with a bunch of guys. Yeah. Why is that suspicious to him? Well, he because Yuri took his truck, and Yuri was going to go out and get laid. That was, like, the idea. Uh-huh, Yuri's uh-huh. like, I'm going out to get laid. And then right. all of a sudden, he sees his truck, and Yuri takes his truck and slaps some stuff on it and then turns it into, like, an army truck, basically. Oh, okay, so that's and what then, it was. I yeah, see. so he he's like, oh, Yuri's betraying me. Like, right there, he realizes something's up. All right, so then in, when they're in the, the warehouse, it sort of plays out, like, the other thing, but without, like, the stupid gunpowder magnetized gunpowder to find an alien thing. The Russians are going to find plutonium. Right. Which is much better. The Russians are going to find plutonium, and instead of instead of having these like moments of trying to find stuff or mystery, I guess, it just breaks right into the action right there. And that's the thing about this uh, draft, which it's just like action scene after action scene, a little bit of break in between, but it's just set piece, set piece, set piece. It's so good, and it's so tight. It moves really fast to different locations and as i like the thing to me that stuck out the most is that last chunk when they finally are like do it finding the mystery of the gods like how to get to the location and they're like lining up like this is the the butterfly or whatever there's like all these different things that are like written into the mountains or whatever when they when they're doing that all of the different things that they see instead of just like kind of big ants that fight they're these giant ants and it's like the ant island or like there's like a giant hummingbird at one point or there's a massive snake that eats indy at one point yeah he gets swallowed which i don't know that could be mishandled but it could be awesome of course (laughs) so i think when i was reading it i was like oh my god if spielberg did that sequence in 1985 or you know whatever it would have been awesome like that's a that's spielberg's that's what he would have thrived at. He wouldn't have made it CGI. It would have been this amazing snake that would have actually eaten him, and he actually would have practically cut himself out. Yeah. So then I, as I was reading it, knowing what Kingdom of the Crystal Skull came out like, I was like, oh, this would have been awful. It would have been awful because it would have been just terrible CGI snake. Mm. It would have looked cheesy as hell, and it just wouldn't have worked. I think if they did it practical and they made a big snake like mm-hmm. – the same kind of way that they made, you know, the Jurassic Park dinosaurs. Like, if it just looked like that, it would have been a fantastic sequence, like an unforgettable sequence. And the other thing about um, this opening part, no gophers. No goddamn gophers. In no gophers. Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, we open up with a gopher. And now I understand the gopher peeks out of the mole or whatever. Is it a mole or a gopher? I don't know, but he peeks out it's of a... It's a gopher, I think. Yeah. Or, or he, a prairie dog? Maybe a prairie maybe dog? Maybe a prairie dog. But I get the like the idea that it's a metaphor. People are going to make a mountain out of a molehill in this movie. You know, you think it's a mountain, but it's a little, a little hill for an animal. And it peeks out. It's cute. But then you cut to like... The gophers, while Indy's fighting the guy on that like atomic sled, and they make those little stupid uh, Star Wars noises, like wee, you know, almost like yeah. they're talking. Lucas, that was all you, you stupid son of a bitch. That's such a Lucas <laughs> moment, such a stupid Lucas moment. Just like, I, I don't think we've had a laugh for a while. Can we get a laugh in? Bring in the gophers. I mean, you oh. know, Lucas, he, he's probably like tried to get in other stuff in there. I don't know. Well, he uh, look in this screenplay for Darabont, there is the moment where somebody swings with the monkeys through the jungle, and instead of Labeef, it's the psychic guy, Owsley or whatever, which to yeah. me makes more sense, because he's almost like a wild animal himself in this version of the script. 
So I love that character. It's Reading so cool. this version of the script and the the like moment when they find him because in in Kingdom of the Crystal Skull he's just like crazy sitting by a fire talking or something. Yeah. In this version he's like a caged monster. Yeah, and so, and like can move things with his mind and just like really well done. Again, a, a, a more fleshed out character. The guy who wrote or finished Kingdom of the Crystal Skull was David Cope. I think that's how you say his name. He wrote uh, the original Jurassic Park, uh, Stir of Echoes. He's done a bunch of big things in Hollywood. I just don't know if he was under really terrible pressure from these two huge movie gods and like just kind of made the most mediocre thing to please them both. That's what the movie feels like. It feels like it's pleasing both of them and giving... Harrison Ford as little work to do as possible. Uh, like, uh, great point in this script. Indy's active. Oh my god, he jumps from a plane to another plane at one point. <laughs> and it could be cool, but in the, in in Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, he's kind of just like looking around. He, he, at the at the climax of Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, he's just like watching. He doesn't do anything. He yeah, just watches. He does zero. It, at the end of this script, at the end of Darabont's script, he literally sees the entire universe. They like that's what's missing from this movie. To me, the biggest differences and the biggest problem with Kingdom of the Crystal Skull is we're given what the movie is going to be about. And at the end, it's exactly what we expect with with Raiders of the Lost Ark. We expect, you know, there's the Ark is going to do something. They're going to find this Ark and it's going to be important. What you see is so much bigger. Like I've seen the movie a hundred times and watching it with my kid. I was like, this is bigger than I remember it. God, he's got faces fucking melting in this movie. Like, this is insanity. Like, it's just crazy that they, that they made that. This movie doesn't have that. This script, however, has Indy... I think Indy po- shoots an alien, doesn't he? Well, he does. So, like, he's tempted with the knowledge of the universe. And as a character thing, that's what Indy really kind of truly wants is the, the infinite knowledge. But instead, he sees Marion and he realizes... That he's got to do the selfless thing, but he also loves her. So um, I think the aliens are granting wishes to, like, the five people who are on the adventure. Uh, Four of them are bad guys. One of them is Indiana Jones. And he chooses Marion. And the alien, knowing that it was a selfless act, releases him and doesn't kill him. Meanwhile, the other villains, he, like, melts their brains. One of them, I think, gets their – he's, like, a Nazi sympathizer and wants to bring the the Nazis back to their full glory, which is a really cool thing – to tie in the Nazis with Indiana Jones, but he gets his heart ripped out by like an Adolf Hitler hologram or something. Something yeah, yeah. insane. <laughs> yeah, there, and there's just a whole bunch of like, there's it, the movie ends with kind of the ultimate Raiders of the Lost Ark, where that's what they were looking for in Raiders was this ability to, you know, have ultimate power. This is what they're getting at the end of this. It's like the ultimate Raiders and. Then and Indy has to make a choice and makes a selfless choice, which is not like Indiana Jones really. Like he's the he's the guy who was like <laughs> in the first movie. It cracked me up when in Raiders when he realizes that if he lets Marion out, that she'll uh, they'll come hunting for them. They'll know they're there. So he just like puts the gag back in her <laughs> mouth and leaves. It's awesome. it's, yeah, it's so awesome. Yeah. So I, I love. Th- and, like, to me, that's what this movie was missing more than anything because they were shoehorning in too many characters that didn't really serve a purpose. Now, I I was thinking about it last night, and the crux of all of these movies, of all of the Indiana Jones movies, is often who is going to betray him. Betrayal is such a huge part of these movies. And if Shia LaBeouf had been, like, the ultimate betrayal... Ooh. I think I think in theory we could have watched it and gone like, holy shit, they did something awesome with Shia LaBeouf. Because we all went into it going like, Jesus, Shia LaBeouf, are you serious? We don't need the LaBeef in our movie. LaBeef. And, <laughs> and then, I like that we've called him LaBeef 12 times and haven't even acknowledged it. <laughs> I just You did it the first time and I just ran with it. I, I was hoping at one point you would at, eventually just be like, does he think his name is actually LaBeef? <laughs> uh, but... Uh, so so the beef. I'm gonna call him the beef the from beef. now on. Where so is the beef. The beef was like promoted huge or like publicized huge when this movie was coming out. He was in all the trailers. It was a huge deal. People were like, even before the movie came out, they were like, "Is is Shia going to be the next indie?" Yeah. And 
if they had totally switched that and he was the betrayer, oh uh, my god, yeah, we his... would have all been like, holy shit. Yeah, Indy's own son is a Soviet agent would have been fucking great. Damn, kid, you should have been pitching Indiana Jones <laughs> of the Kingdom of the Asshole Skull. I will say, uh, I gotta say this, the end of 